So two weeks ago, we heard the story of Jesus meeting a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. If you knew who I was, Jesus tells her, you would ask me for the water of eternal life. And if you drank it, you would never be thirsty again. Now this week, instead of water, Jesus offers us bread, the bread of life in the form of his own body. Uh, Please pray with me. God, of all that is, we want to live lives of meaning, depth, and purpose. Give us the grace to follow Jesus, to grow strong in our ability to love, and to deepen our trust in you, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer. In Jesus' name, amen. So our relationship with bread has changed some in the last couple hundred years. These days, bread is something that comes in a plastic bag, right? And it's light and airy and pre-sliced. And we use it for sandwiches or maybe as a side dish uh, for dinner or soup and salad. Bread is mostly known as a source of carbs, right? Carbs. But in the past, bread has been a much bigger part of people's diets. Bread, daily bread, as we pray about it in in the Jesus prayer, was pretty much most of the food people ate, which doesn't sound like a whole lot to eat, but we are talking about whole grain organic bread here, right? So there was a lot more to it in terms of both nutrition and how filling it was, so people were able and did rely on it. This is why it was so upsetting to the French peasants when Marie Antoinette was told that the people didn't have bread, and she responded, let them eat cake as though people who couldn't afford bread would be able to buy cake instead. No bread meant really no food. It was enough to fuel the flames of the French Revolution. And in Russia, under under siege from the Nazis, so this is actually like 70 years ago, the people of Leningrad managed to live for three and a half years, years eating only traditional Russian black bread made from rye and wheat flour. These breads are very different from what we see in the bread aisle at the grocery store. If you were going to rely on Wonder Bread, like these people relied on their traditional breads, you'd be well toast. Sorry. All right, thank you. I made that up myself. I know, right? Heather was going to do a rim shot for me, but she didn't. Couldn't find it. Hey, oh, thank you. All right. that gives new meaning when Jesus says today in the Gospel of John, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life, nourishing and filling and tough even. I am the bread of life, totally ordinary, commonplace, and day to day. I am the bread of life, basic, necessary, and the foundation for everything else. Come on. So what has just happened in the scripture, before we pick it up here, is that Jesus has performed a miracle, feeding thousands of people from a few loaves of bread, which is a pretty good trick, right? Nice job, Jesus. And the people are grateful. They would love to have more of this. They try to crown Jesus as their king. If you can keep feeding us this way, they say, we are all yours. But Jesus refuses that and walks away. Feeding the 5,000 is a sign of the creative goodness of God's presence, but it's not intended to be a way of life. It's a sign intended to wake people up, to show them that Jesus is more than he seems to be, that God is at work in him in unexpected ways. So Jesus' next move is not to give the people what they want, but to ask them to take it to the next level. He tells them that they may be looking for someone to feed them day to day like they were fed in the wilderness by the manna that came down from heaven. But now there is a new kind of bread for them to eat so that they can enter into a new kind of life, eternal life. What does it mean then for Jesus to say that I am the bread of life? Throughout his teaching, Jesus tells us about the kingdom of God, and in the Gospel of John, he also describes it as eternal life, a reality that starts now and here on earth, but that expands outward and beyond what we can see here and now. Eternal life is life lived in relationship to the eternal God. And Jesus is there as a mediator, the staple, the bread of that life. Jesus makes that relationship possible, In calling us to eternal life, Jesus calls us to live lives that go beyond survival. Jesus calls us to trust and to love, 
because our survival, our bread, is in God through him. There's more to life than bread. There is eternal life, and I am the bread of that life, he says, nourishing, commonplace, and needed every day. And what is it that Jesus does to be this bread of life? He gives of himself. He gives up his body and his life, his blood, for the sake of his disciples and his friends, and even for the sake of his enemies, and for the sake of people he will never meet personally. Eat my body, Jesus says. Drink my blood. It's kind of graphic. If you've been hanging around churches for a while, you might get used to the language, right? But if you really think about it, there's a little bit of a vampire thing going on, right? All right. But what is more graphic, and in a way, the thing that Jesus is softening, is the terrible death that he dies on the cross, that he's hung by his arm, he bleeds and suffocates, like so many people before him. And it's under the totally reasonable expectation by the people doing it that he'll be forgotten almost as soon as he dies, right? It's a, humili- it's a humiliating death, and, but that is the death that God accepts in order to turn the terror, the oppression, the pain, all of it, inside out. And by doing that, to give us life in the face of death, forgiveness in the face of horror, and a mirror in the face of oppression and abuse of power. That is the power and the depth of God's love given to us in the body and the lifeblood of Jesus. So in communion, we take the bread and the juice into our bodies as symbols of eating and drinking Jesus' body and blood. And that communion connects us and draws us into eternal life, the life that is really life, abundant life. And that is a life that looks beyond survival to tending to our relationships, our connections with God, with each other, and with the whole world. So, um, this week, Interfaith Power and Light, which is a nonprofit organization that encourages people of faith to work together for the good of the environment, is organizing a climate change preach in so that people across the faith spectrum would hear sermons and homilies and reflections on what climate change means for us morally, morally and what we as people of faith can do about it. Now, you might be thinking maybe you should wait until one of those really hot weeks in August to talk about climate change. Right? Maybe you didn't notice all the snow we got last week? Well, that's what makes it so important to talk about it now, to keep speaking up, even when the weather is cold, because even though the weather can fluctuate from week to week, or even day to day, the change in the climate is happening steadily and slowly over the long time frame of years and of decades. So our scripture comes into play in two ways as we're looking at climate change or any difficult issue that we're facing, but climate change today. First, Jesus calls us to a life that is really life, a life that goes beyond daily bread, a life that goes beyond the material, a life beyond being afraid for our survival. And one of the reasons that climate change is happening is that for most of us humans living in developed nations, it's very hard to stop living in a material space, to stop thinking about and buying and using stuff. So I don't know if you've noticed, but there are a lot of commercials out there, for example, right? I've only ever bought two cars in my entire life, but I have probably seen 300 million car commercials, right? So here's a quiz. Uh, Don't think it doesn't sink in. I guess that's the point of the quiz. So we're going to do a quiz. What make of car is a Durango? Dodge, thank you. Um, How about an F-150? Ford, yep. Now, does anyone own a Dodge Durango or a Ford F-150? All right, I didn't think so. So why do we need to know that, right? But we do. It's like automatic, all right? It gets in there. It's, uh, it's subconscious. And so the problem is the reason that we have that embedded in our subconscious is because the, the economy needs or wants to keep growing and expanding. But to do that, it has to use up resources like fossil fuels and put out waste products like carbon dioxide. And there's a limit to those resources, and there's a limit to the planet's capacity to absorb the waste products. And that limit doesn't get figured into what we think of as the economy, as the financial calculations of what's important, right? So that brings us to connections. Jesus tells the disciples that to receive eternal life, they must eat his flesh and drink his body. And when we eat the bread and drink the juice for communion, we generally remember it as a symbol of Jesus' life and death and love for us. 
But eating communion, like eating any food, is also an act of connecting and communing with the whole earth. Our bodies come from the earth, and they go back to it when we die. The molecules of water that we drink and the nutrients that we eat go into our bodies. They get broken apart or burned and used to build us up, and then they go out again. We breathe out carbon dioxide, breathe in oxygen. Plants breathe in that same carbon dioxide that we don't need and breathe out the oxygen that we do need. It's very convenient. Physically, we are all connected to the earth. And through the earth, through these simple products of, grain, uh, of the grain fields and the vineyards, through Jesus who came to us as God in the flesh, we are connected to everything. It's not a coincidence that Jesus came in the flesh. We are connected to the whole of creation, and the actions that we take affect the whole of creation. So what does this mean for living an abundant life? First, that an abundant life is not one that focuses on the literal bread while missing out on the bread of life. That a relationship to God comes first, not as a side dish, but as the main course. And second, that we recognize in our communion, our connection with the earth, with our creator, and with one another. God's love for us and for the whole creation is tremendous. And at the same time, commonplace. It's all around us if we can look and find ways to see it and to listen. So my hope is that our response will be one of love and of trust. And may we receive together the bread of life and through it, eternal life. Thanks be to God. Amen. So let's have a moment for silence and reflection. And then... Um, We'll have a quick community conversation about what does communion or what does the Eucharist mean to you. So let's begin.